Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 137, The Conversion. Now this week we'll talk about the end of the rule of the Teutonic Knights in Prussia. Instead of a land controlled by chivalry Goda answering the Pope, Prussia became a secular state, ruled by a Protestant prince and run by a newly created class of landowners, the famous Prussian Junkers, whose impact on German history stretched well into the 20th century. But the conversion of the last Grand Master and his submission to the Polish crown wasn't the end of the order. In fact, the order still exists to this day, though in a fundamentally different form, which is another fascinating history we'll explore in this episode. But before we start, a big thank you to our supporters who've signed up on patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or have made a generous one-time donation at historyofthegermans.com slash support. And this week I want to acknowledge James H. S., Oliver K., Cole P., Fluritz, and Dominique, who've already signed up. Last week we left the scene in 1466 when Grandmaster Ludwig von Ehrlichshausen signed the second piece of Torn, bringing an end to devastating 13 years of war. At the end of the conflict, Prussia was divided into two parts. Royal Prussia, that comprised the old Polish Duchy of Pomerelia in Western Prussia, and then the Order's State of East Prussia, with its capital at Königsberg, modern-day Kaliningrad. Royal Prussia, as the name indicates, was ruled by the King of Poland, whilst East Prussia was all that was left of the Order's territory in Prussia. Eastern Prussia was by far the poorer part. The great centres of Gdansk, Elblak and Torun were lost to the Order, and with it the trade along the Vistula River that connected the rich agricultural lands and mineral wealth of Central Europe to the Baltic. The agricultural surplus, such as it was, was exported either via Königsberg or the busy harbours of Gdansk and Elblak. Apart from grain and wood, the other main export was the oldest product of the region, amber, on which the order still retained a de facto monopoly. The second piece of torn did not only result in a material change in territory, but also in a change of status. Up to 1466, the order in Prussia managed to stay fairly independent. Based on the Golden Bull of Rimini and the Papal Letter from 1234, the Grand Master was both an imperial prince and an immediate vassal of the Pope. They had also some sort of link to the Polish crown, as Conrad of Mazovia had given them the Kulma land on terms that, the order argued, were full independence and the Polish chronicler's claim included some sort of vassalage. It is likely that the order preferred to keep things vague, because having multiple masters meant they had ultimately none. In 1466, Ludwig von Ehrlichhausen was forced to swear an oath of allegiance to the King of Poland, and he had to further promise that from now on at least half of the new recruits into the order were Poles. Now, this latter provision ended up being unenforceable due to the resistance within the order and the reluctance of the Polish nobility to join. And on the former, the vassalage to the Polish crown, each Grand Master following Ludwig von Ehrlichshausen tried to wriggle out of. The war had also brought a significant social change to East Prussia. As we said before, the state of the order had tried to hold on to most of the land and castles for itself and restricted the creation of a local aristocracy. That was particularly the case in East Prussia, where the nobles, such as they existed, were either descendants of the leadership of the old Prussian tribes or former settlers who made good. But during the Thirteen Years' War, a new nobility appeared in Prussia. These were the mercenary commanders the Grand Master had been unable to pay. So instead of gold coin, they were given land, either land of the order or land taken from the local nobility that had sided with the Prussian League. And some of the more famous names amongst the East Prussian nobility, like the von Dona, von Eulenburg, von Schlieben and von Lehndorf, came into Prussia during this period. These new landowners weren't tied to the order and its ancient ways of working. In particular, they had no qualms pushing the formerly free peasants into a dependency to the local lord that was on the verge of turning them into actual serfs. Given how weak the Grand Master had become, there was little he could do to stop them, if he ever intended to do so. And the order itself began to fracture. 
the Comtours, the senior officers and the heads of the castle convents began to treat their estates as if they were their own. They refused to pass on their profits to the headquarters in Königsberg. One of them even became a pirate who menaced Hanse shipping and could only be stopped when the Grand Master raised an army and stormed his castle at Memel. Those who did not act so blatantly still demanded to be treated like magnates within the state and get a seat in the Landrat, the representation of the estates of Prussia alongside the bishops, the cities and the nobles. The Grand Master's income was limited to the manors linked directly to Königsberg, which meant that any major investment, any war or action of any kind required the consent of the various estates represented in the Landrat. And then there was the Bishopric of Ermland. Now, the bishops of Ermland always had a more independent position than the other three bishoprics, and we heard last week had become neutral at the later stages of the Thirteen Years' War, which was another nail in the coffin of the order struggle. Now, in the Peace of Torn, the bishop too had to accept vassalage to the King of Poland, but his diocese was made part of Royal Prussia, rather than East Prussia. And the problem with that was that Ermland sits right in the middle of East Prussia. So unsurprisingly, the conflict between the Order and Poland resumes with Ermland. When the bishopric becomes vacant in 1467, the chapter elects Nicolaus von Tüngen as bishop. King Casimir of Poland does not like von Tüngen, rejects his appointment and puts someone else in place. Now at which point the Pope gets involved and insists on von Tüngen. But still von Tüngen can't get to Ermland and he has to take refuge in Riga, from where he tries to build an alliance in support for his claim. He finds a sponsor in the form of the King of Hungary, who pays for an army that captures some of Ermland on the bishop's behalf. In 1477 the Grand Master feels that things have moved on sufficiently so that he can join the fight. And since he was now at war with Poland anyway, he rescinds his vassalage to the King of Poland. At which point the Poles come down with a sizable army. The usual burning and pillaging ensues, though the Poles fail to take any of the major cities. However, the Grand Master's resources are quickly exhausted, and the King of Hungary withdraws his support, so another war ends with the defeat of the Order. Ermland returns under Polish control and the Grand Master is made to bend the knee again. This whole ramshackle structure limps on for another 20 years until the Grand Master Johann von Tiefen suggests a way out. So far, the members of the Order and its Grand Master had been recruited mainly from the lower nobility of the Empire. There were the occasional Grand Masters from the princely houses but all of them had joined the order as simple knights and had worked their way through the ranks. The downside of this process was that none of the magnates of the empire had a personal relationship with the order anymore. And given its abject lack of resources, the order now needed a powerful sponsor, or sponsors. The proposed way to acquire one of these sponsors was to offer the role of Grand Master to a second son of a great magnate who would then provide money and men to help the order. The person they settled on was Friedrich von Sachsen, youngest son of the Duke of Saxony. Friedrich had been destined for a career in the church and had studied at Siena, Bologna and Leipzig. So he ticked all the boxes. In 1497 he was admitted to the order and immediately elevated to Grand Master. Friedrich von Sachsen sat down to restructure the state. Part of the agreement he had made the leaders of the order to sign before joining was that they would materially increase the financial support to the centre. Once elevated, he pushed through further reforms, very much on the model of a territorial principality like the one he had grown up in. He reintroduced regular visitations to the various castles and towns where he inspected the discipline of the brothers and he held court, solving disputes between the people and the order. He restructured the army and established a professional bureaucracy. Basically, he operated like a 15th century territorial prince. He even held festivities in Königsberg Palace for the local nobility, with music and shock horror in the presence of ladies. As for the main political objective, he made some progress too. 
as the senior officers of the order had hoped, Friedrich gathered some support in the empire for a secession from the Polish crown. The Emperor Maximilian encouraged him to refuse the oath of vassalage to the King of Poland. But once he had declared his intention, Prussia had to expect retaliation from Poland any minute. Though that did not happen, or at least not on the scale feared, Friedrich felt unsafe in Königsberg and relocated back to Rochlitz in Saxony, leaving a governor in his place. Hmm. Despite this then in the end rather disappointing result, the order continued in his policy and sought another high aristocrat as Grand Master when Friedrich died in 1510. This one was a certain Albrecht, who happens to be the very first member of the House of Hohenzollern to make an appearance as a story protagonist on this podcast. And little shows how far the order had fallen, and they could not even afford a proper second son. But only one of the ten sons of Markgraf Friedrich von Brandenburg Ansbach, an over-indebted, incompetent ruler of the small county of Ansbach, who himself was only the second son of the elector of Brandenburg. That's the one who had actual power. That being said, Albrecht von Brandenburg will leave an indelible mark on the history of the Teutonic Order. He picked up where his predecessor had left off. Like him, he had settled with the leadership of the Order on some ground rules. Even more support for the central authority, willingness to accept reforms, and granting him the lifestyle of a lord rather than a master of a chivalric order. One request close to his heart was that he should be relieved from the oath of chastity. Celibacy, yeah, that was something he was okay with, just not chastity. As I say, getting a good CEO, one has to make some sacrifices. Though it seems his new brothers had already developed a rather lax attitude towards the rules of St. Benedict. The transition to a territorial state continued. Albrecht relied mainly on close associates, like the Bishop of Pomesania and civil bureaucrats to run the administration, and refused to appoint replacements for the senior officers of the order once they had retired or died. The other main political project he continued was, well, the attempt to get out from under Polish vassalage. So, he went on a public relations campaign in the empire, arguing that East Prussia, or all of Prussia in his mind, were part of the Deutsche Lande, the German lands. And he had some success. The Reichstag in Augsburg in 1512 declared the second piece of Torn invalid. The Polish king then went to the Pope, who ordered Albrecht to, well, to do as he was ordered, and swear allegiance to his uncle, King Sigismund of Poland. In 1515, Emperor Charles V changed his mind and withdrew his support for Albrecht. Now, Albrecht needed a new supporter quick, and he found one. Grand Duke Vasily III of Moscow, who had been at war with Poland-Lithuania for a long while. Well, that was worth is unclear, because when Albrecht actually kicked off hostilities in 1519, not a lot of Muscovy soldiers were seen in his army. This war lasted just 18 months. And though Albrecht was in fact quite ill-equipped for such an endeavour, the Polish army, that inevitably showed up, failed to take any of the major strongholds and in particular failed in its siege of Königsberg. Albrecht then rustled up some Danish mercenaries from Livonia, when the Livonian master refused to aid him, who were expensive but effective and pushed the Poles back to the Vistula River and then the money ran out. The Danes went home and thanks to mediation by the Emperor, the Pope and the two sides agreed on a four-year truce. It's now 1522, and Albrecht von Brandenburg travels to the Empire to find out, well, why nobody came to help him and whether they would be coming when the truce runs out in 1525. But everywhere he went, he hit a brick wall. Even his brother in Christ, the German master of the Teutonic Order, outright refused to spend any more money on that futile, expensive war in Prussia and most of the German princes took their lead from that and withheld support, save for giving him their best wishes and prayers. But he did meet someone who was offering a solution. 
Whilst Albrecht was busy fighting the Poles, a professor at the University of Wittenberg had printed a list of 95 theses and distributed them widely, including having them posted on the door of All Saints Church. And that professor, as you obviously know, was Martin Luther. Luther's demands for reform had spread rapidly. In 1521 he had defended them before the Reichstag in Worms, which had made them the topic of discussion all over Europe. Already in that same year one of Albrecht's associates had proposed to consult with Luther about possible ways to reform the order. But that attempt failed as the elector of Saxony, who protected Luther on the Wartburg, was unwilling to act as middleman. In 1523 Luther is back in Wittenberg and ready to receive visitors. Albrecht sent his associate in a secret mission to discuss possible changes in the structure of the order. And then in November Albrecht himself goes to Wittenberg and meets with Luther and Melanchthon. The reformers are blunt. Quote, Monks are nothing but wizards and associates of the devil who have fooled the world with their bogus tricks and artifice. End quote. And Luther has some more choice words about monasticism, which I will refrain from mentioning here, but let's say only an ex-monk can be so harsh on his former vocation. And so if monks should leave the monasteries to become useful members of society, that is what chivalric brothers should do too. So, their proposal, make yourself the duke of a secular state and cast the order into the dustbin of history. And, as is Luther's habit, he follows the meeting up by writing a public proclamation suggesting that quote, Lords of the Teutonic Order, give up false chastity and seek the true chastity of the marriage bed. End quote. Albrecht, meanwhile, had returned to Prussia, where he finds many of his close associates thrilled by Luther's proposals. So are the estates of Prussia, the cities and nobles who would much rather have a secular duke as overlord than a corporation of monkish warriors. Some of the bishops had picked up the Protestant faith as well, whilst preachers have come to Prussia proclaiming the time for fundamental change had come. At the same time, the clock is ticking. The timeline of the truce has been running down. Albrecht explores one more time whether there is anyone willing to give him the funds to continue the fight, but has to conclude that this is no longer a viable option. So he meets with King Sigismund who suggests that Albrecht, well, dissolves the order and becomes a duke and vassal to the Polish king. With no more options left, Grandmaster Albrecht von Brandenburg signs on the dotted line puts his hands into the hands of the Polish monarch and rises again as Duke Albrecht of Prussia. That was on April 10, 1525. It's only two months later that Albrecht formally declares for the Lutheran faith. Are these things connected? The historian Jürgen Sarnowski argues that these two events, the creation of Duke of Prussia and the conversion to the Protestant faith, had been independent events. The Emperor Charles V, Pope Clement VII and King Sigismund supported the creation of the Duchy and the dissolution of the order in the belief that a Duke Albrecht would remain a faithful son of the Church. Now if so, it was quite naive. Luther's pamphlet and Albrecht's visit to Wittenberg cannot have gone unnoticed and many observers in Germany had already voiced concerns that the Grand Master was at least tilting towards the Reformation. Now this first conversion of a spiritual principality not only changed the status of the Grand Master, it also had a huge impact on the remaining Knights Brothers. Some were unwilling to accept the Reformation and left for the Order's convents in Germany that had stayed faithful to the Pope. But the majorities were happy to leave their convents, marry and make babies. And they did not leave empty-handed. Many of the possessions of the Order were handed over to the Knights Brothers as private property. And so the former Knight brothers were now nobles, or as the East Prussians were often called, Junkers. They followed in the footsteps of the mercenary Junkers who had come into land 50 years earlier, 
and they established large estates with dependent peasants tilling the land. A lasting peace, the secularization of the bishoprics and other monastic lands, and the establishment of a tax-gathering bureaucracy provided Albrecht finally with the funds to rebuild his battered state. And he did that fairly successfully. He invested particularly in education, he founded schools in the major cities, and the University of Königsberg, the future alma mater of Immanuel Kant. He reigned for a solid 43 years as duke and passed away in 1568 from the plague. He was succeeded by his son Albrecht Friedrich, who was deposed due to severe mental illness. Then the duchy went through a number of regions from the Hohenzollern family, until they, well, almost all died out, and then Prussia became part of the states of the Elector of Brandenburg, one of whose descendants crowned himself and his wife as king in Prussia in Königsberg in 1701. King in Prussia, not king of Prussia, because Prussia was still under Polish overlordship. We will no doubt spend a lot of time talking about Prussia on this podcast, so we can leave this story here. But as for the Teutonic Order, this was not the end of the story. When Albrecht unveiled his shock announcement that he was to convert to the Lutheran faith, the other two masters, the Livonian master and the German master, were aghast. Both were men in their 70s and deeply loyal to the Pope. Now they saw the man they had regarded as their leader and their commander to become a secular prince and become immediately excommunicated. The Liefland master, Walter von Plettenberg, saw himself as a bulwark against the expanding Orthodox Grand Duchy of Moscow. But Livonia was in Prussia. In Livonia there had always been other powers present. The cities of Riga, Dorpat and Narva, the bishops and the local aristocracy. The cities as member of the Hanse saw their brethren in Lübeck, Hamburg and Danzig pick up Lutheranism. And so they followed suit. Plettenberg had to allow Protestant preachers into the land, and even inside the order the new religion gained support. Under his successes, the order kept shifting more and more away from Catholicism. And when Muscovy under Ivan the Terrible invaded, the order sought help from abroad, mostly from Protestant Denmark and Sweden, and this help did not come for free, and the state of the order crumbled quickly. The last Livonian master, Gotthard Kettler, swore allegiance to King Sigismund II of Poland in 1561, dissolved the order in Livonia and became Duke of Kurland. As in Prussia, the lands of the order were distributed amongst the brothers, who became part of the already sizable German-speaking aristocracy that dominated these lands until the Bolshevik Revolution. The German branch of the order did hold out longer. They, too, had to balance the religious differences. In the interest of keeping the organization going, brothers were allowed to convert to Lutheranism if they so chose. In the 17th century, they also admitted Calvinists, which turned the order into a multi-confessional community. There was, however, a major problem. The Lutheran and Calvinist brothers wanted the property they had been administering, or more precisely enjoying, to pass to their descendants. And in that, they often found support from Protestant territorial princes, who they served as officers or administrators. And as the children of former warrior monks inherited these estates, the property of the order quickly eroded. Only in southern Germany was the order able to retain or even expand its territory. The German master moved his seat to Mergentheim in 1527, he established one of these statelets the Holy Roman Empire had hundreds of. In 1590, the order elected Maximilian of Habsburg as its German and now also Grand Master. From 1641 onwards, all Grand Masters were members of the Habsburg family as a sinecure for younger sons. And when I say younger, I really mean younger. The youngest was just 13 years old when he entered the order, and he became instantly elected as a successor to Hermann von Salza. As for the less exalted members of the order, an element of the martial tradition remained. Members were required to serve at least three years in the wars against the Ottoman Empire 
as officers in the Habsburg armies. When Napoleon did away with all these little statelets to create more efficient entities to furnish him with soldiers, the last remaining properties of the Teutonic Knights, including Mercantime, were secularized. But still, the order continued to exist. The Habsburgs kept supporting it, making it an honorary chivalric order. Its activities, sponsored by the honorees, reverted back to its roots, hospitals and schools. When the Habsburg monarchy fell in 1918, the order had another crisis. They had lost their sponsor, and as far as the public were concerned, well, they were just part of the now defunct monarchy. The last Habsburg Grandmaster resigned, and in 1929 the Pope gave the order a new rule. Under this new rule, only priests and nuns were full members of the order, and they should solely focus on religious tasks, in particular caring for the sick and the elderly, and for education. The order has its headquarters in Vienna, and today has about 200 priests and 100 nuns. Well, and that brings the story of the Teutonic Knights to its end. Now, I recognize that this part of history plays a huge role in the national narratives of Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and even Russia and Romania. A role much more significant than it played in the German national story, I mean, even in the 19th century. That did not mean we did not develop our usual mix of fact and fiction that described the order as well. A bit rough around the edges, but ultimately a bringer of civilization to a savage land. And the Nazis picked up some of the order's iconography, and they built the Ordensburgen as school buildings for the Nazi elite, while suppressing the actual order. Then after the war, the perception history of the Teutonic Knight underwent the same critical assessment we have seen with all these medieval stories that have been instrumentalized for German nationalist narrative. How deep that went, I struggle to properly pin down, because for me, as someone from the southwest of the country, with no relations to the people who have been expelled from Prussia in 1945, the Teutonic Knights had become, well, just a story, and quite frankly, a story I was not that particularly interested in at the time. And that is certainly very different from the experience of somebody whose grandparents or even parents had to leave Prussia under atrocious circumstances in 1945. So given these sensitivities, I was even more focused on painting an accurate and balanced picture of events in these episodes than usual. I tried to stick close to primary sources and recent scholarship. And should I have made mistakes, and I almost certainly have made many, I do apologize. It was not out of malice, but lack of attention. And as we are on the subject, a quick shout out to all of you who posted interesting and informative comments on the Facebook posts I put out on these topics. And in particular, a big thanks to listener Marius G for his kind message the other day. So, what will be next? Well, the next series will pick up where we left off nearly a year ago, with the death of Emperor Frederick II. We will go through the chaos of the so-called Interregnum before we alight in the reign of the Luxembourg Emperors, starting with Henry VII. And forgive me if I have to take a few weeks to get started. As usual, I need to get my bearings before we dive in, but I hope you will come along for that adventure. <laughs>